You are listening to the Shoto, Brady, and Dutton Sermon Audio. We would love for you to join us live and in person any Sunday. You can watch the sermon video on Sunday afternoons through our Facebook page or at our website, umshoto.net. If you love what we're doing here, you can donate to our ministries at umshoto.net. Thanks for joining us wherever you are. The scripture this week comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 25. And thanks for a scripture with no hard biblical names. (laughs) One day while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus, but finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, Who is this who is speaking blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Stand up and walk? But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up and take your bed and go home. Immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Tootie. Well, we continue our sermon series, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, going through and journeying with Mr. Rogers and Jesus on what it means to be a good neighbor. And I hope through this series we've learned a lot about what it means to be a neighbor with or from two of the most neighborly people that I think have ever lived. Of course, Jesus and Mr. Rogers. In this sermon series, this this beautiful day in the neighborhood, I hope that we've learned that we can share our feelings. To be honest with what we are going through and to be genuine about listening to our neighbor when we ask how they're doing. And to be honest when we've been asked. Last week we dug into the prodigal son and father and, and moved towards being wastefully extravagant. Hopefully giving with zero expectation of receiving anything in return. And so far, Jesus and Mr. Rogers, uh, they've taught us how to be more authentic. How to be more empathetic. And how to be more generous neighbors. Hopefully to stop living this life with any expectation that, that you have to be someone that you're not. That you have to ignore the feelings that are deep down and the real emotions we have as human beings. But to embrace them. To talk about them. To feel. When we go out into this world that, that we've also learned that to be a neighbor that we welcome home. All who have wandered off. That we stop qualifying forgiveness and grace and offer it to only those who deserve it or feel entitled to it. But we begin to see people, ourselves included, as Jesus does. As people, as neighbors who who are deeply loved and all of us are in need of God's love and grace. We're journeying towards being a neighbor. And today we continue that journey with the willingness to have hard conversations. As I took a look at the world around us, our our culture, there is this expectation that, well, we keep conversation casual. Even if it's with friends and family, we have a hard time going on a deeper level with one another. 
And there are these unspoken social rules that call us not to talk about certain things. And I have to ask you, do you know what those two things are? What are we not to talk about in public or with company? This is the interactive part of the sermon. Politics and what else? Religion. And religion. Where do we find that? It's, I don't think it's written down anywhere, but we know the rule, right? We abide by this unwritten rule that we can't talk about religion or politics. I'm not sure where it comes from. I can't pinpoint it in history, but it seems like this social rule was really instituted and has become solidified in our society. See, when we look back through our history, we find that conversations about religion and politics, well, they weren't safe to have. They weren't safe conversations to have. They got you in trouble and could have got you killed. They had harsh consequences for sharing your ideas or differences. And so people began, as a safety measure, to abide by this. We don't talk about politics or religion. But today, today I would argue that we don't have these conversations. We don't talk about religion and politics, not out of fear for our safety, but because they make us uncomfortable. And they are uncomfortable conversations to have. Because we might have to disagree with someone. We might have to find that somebody didn't vote or doesn't believe like we do. And oh my gosh, how could that be? And so we become uncomfortable. We're not in danger. We're just uncomfortable. See, Mr. Rogers had a beautiful way of talking about the really difficult topics. It's a groundbreaking thing he did. He actually talked about them. He didn't shy away from any topic. In fact, he didn't shy away from things like the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. or Robert Kennedy. He talked openly about divorce and civil rights and racism, just to name a few. He talked about them. And here's the thing about Mr. Rogers, is he knew. He understood that the children around him, the children that were seeing him in the TV, the children that were among us, were seeing this world as it was. And they deserved a place at the table to understand what was going on. That not only did it deeply affect them, but it deeply affected the adults around them, and they were watching. They were paying attention and they didn't know what to do, so Mr. Rogers talked about it because nobody else would. Fred Rogers often said, anything that is mentionable is manageable. And so he found creative ways to talk about the very hard issues. Often Mr. Rogers, to do this, he would travel to the land of make-believe, where he would talk to puppets like Daniel Tiger, or King Friday the 13th, and humans, and people. They'd come together and they would have these hard conversations and help each other as friends to understand, to learn and grow. Now in the world of make-believe, there are really interesting conversations between people and puppets. But it helped break the ice. It helped them learn and grieve and find understanding in these really hard moments. And Mr. Rogers did it beautifully. Because he believed that if we had the courage to talk about a topic or an issue or a difference, that we could find a way to heal. That we could find common ground. To offer forgiveness and to be a neighbor. In church, I'll argue with, argue about this, I suppose. That everything is mentionable. And if we can mention it, we can manage it. We can work through it. We can talk about it. Even politics and religion. And I know what you're thinking, Pastor, don't talk about politics or religion today. But guess what? We're going to talk about it. It may make us uncomfortable, but we gonna, we're going to talk about it. We have to. Because if we look around the world, 
it's there. There is plenty to talk about in both of these areas. And there's no secret. There's no secret that if we turn on the news or open anything, that there's enough politics to cover us for a lifetime. And it doesn't matter what year it is. It doesn't matter who's elected. It doesn't matter what's going on. We are not talking about it because we're uncomfortable. And so the conversation goes unhad. Religion's not any better. We've opened the news in the last couple of weeks, and just in the United Methodist Church, there's plenty to talk about. And it's not just in the last couple of weeks or the last couple of years. For 40 some odd years, we have not been having the conversation in the church surrounding human sexuality, surrounding a lot of things. And now it's all coming to a head. And the national media is picking up on it. And guess what? We've been caught by surprise. We've been caught off guard because we're not having the conversations while everyone else is. And we're not having them because these conversations are not easy. They're hard. And that's part of why we don't have them. But we're also trying to keep ourselves comfortable and safe. Because what happens if we find out that the person sitting in the pew across the room, well, they voted differently than me. Or they feel differently about the LGBTQ community and their place in our church. What do we do with that kind of information? So we just don't talk about it. Because when we find out that people believe differently than us, what happens is we begin to build walls and barriers and then we stop talking altogether. We stop having any kind of conversation because we're uncomfortable. And rather than being honest and trying to learn and to understand our neighbors, well, we just try to yell the loudest. We try to be the loudest in the room. We try to yell the loudest across the fence so that our voice is heard, rather than talking. And yet again, time after time, Mr. Rogers and Jesus, they teach us one thing about being a neighbor and all the time it is to simply listen. To listen, not to respond, but to learn. Because anything that is mentionable is manageable. If we can talk about it, we can work together. We may not agree at the end of the day, and that is okay, church. That is good. That is healthy. Because you took the time, we took the time to listen. To build a relationship rather than a wall. The truth is, the neighbor that you may fundamentally disagree with might be the person that you desperately need later in life, that desperately needs you later in life. And rather than asking, well, I need help, but who'd you vote for? I need help, but what do you think about this? I need help, but whatever hot button issue, if we're not on it, you can't help me or I can't help you. No, church, we're not going to do that, are we? We're going to be there. Because when a friend asks for help, when a neighbor asks for help, we show up. We have to. So it begs the question. It begs the question, how did Jesus manage the unmentionable? Well, church, he had really uncomfortable conversations like all of the time. He ate and drank with those who were deemed as sinners. He taught in the streets. He answered questions from the religious to the lay people, to the Gentiles, and everyone in between, all of the time. He answered tough questions about resurrection, about the Roman government, about who is his right-hand man from his own disciples. He answered questions about what kind of king he was going to be, about divorce and about poverty, about people who were sick and dying and deemed unclean. He had these conversations, and guess what? It gets him in trouble. And it gets them in more than just trouble. It gets them killed. But Jesus met these unmentionable conversations head on and had honest conversations in the face of his own safety and comfort. In fact, there are many moments throughout the gospel that Jesus has very taboo and uncomfortable and unsafe conversations. Anytime Jesus heals someone, it's followed with some kind of controversy. The people around him are unsure and often indignant because they disagree with Jesus. It was Jesus healing on the Sabbath. 
forgiving sins, being with the downtrodden and the unclean that was so countercultural. It was so unsafe, but he went anyways to learn, to be there, to help with healing. One of my favorite stories in the whole gospel, and it seems like I preach on it at least once a year because it's that good, I think. But it just ruffles so many feathers by confronting the unmentionable. So when Jesus hears, heals the paralytic, that is quite literally dropped through the roof. Hear the gospel again. On the day when Jesus was teaching, the Pharisees and legal experts were sitting nearby. They had come from every village in Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. Now the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal. Some men were bringing a man who was paralyzed, lying on a cot. They wanted to carry him in and place him before Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they took him. They took him up to the roof, and they lowered him, cot and all, through the roof tiles into the crowded room in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. And the legal experts and the Pharisees, well, they began to mutter among themselves, Who is this? Who is this that insults God? Only God can forgive sins. Jesus recognized what they were discussing and responded, Why do you fill your minds with these questions? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and walk. But so that you will know that the human one has authority on earth to forgive sins, Jesus now spoke to the paralyzed man. I say to you, get up, take your cot, and go home. And right away the man stood up, he picked up his cot, and he went home praising God. Jesus asked the questions, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk? Essentially, what Jesus is saying here to the Pharisees, what he's asking them and the religious leaders, is which is better for you? Which one makes you feel better? Which one makes you feel safe? And which one makes you feel uncomfortable? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? They mean the same thing, church. They mean the same thing. But he's asking them, which one are you willing to hear? Which phrase allows you to see what is going on around you? And the problem, church, the problem with the Pharisees and the religious leaders is they didn't want to hear. They didn't want to hear either phrase. They simply wanted to ignore this paralyzed man because if they ignore him, they don't have to deal with him. They don't have to deal with his illness or his dignity. Ignoring hard conversations is to ignore human dignity, is to ignore that we all are in need of God's love and grace, each and every one of us. But to ignore that is to ignore human dignity. It begins to build a society that is so divided and scared and apathetic to have meaningful conversations that we no longer have conversations at all. That we simply just try to be the loudest voice in the room and yell louder than the person beside us that disagrees so that our voice will be heard. But church, that's not what Jesus does here. That's not what Jesus does here. It's not what he does when he says, your sins are forgiven. Pick up your mat and go. He didn't say it louder. He didn't say it loud enough to drown out the naysayers. Those who thought differently and opposed him, he simply asked the question again. And then he turns to the paralyzed man and acknowledges human dignity and he says, I say to you, get up, take your cot, go home. And right away the man jumps up, stands before him, picks up his cot, and he goes home, praising God. But if Jesus would have bought into this idea that we can't talk about politics or religion, that we can't have these hard conversations because we might be uncomfortable, if he would have bought into that, when the man is lowered through the ceiling, he would have ignored him. Even if he said, your sins are forgiven, and the, as the religious leaders begin to grumble, he would have said, oh, just kidding. I didn't mean it. 
He goes back on it. If that's what Jesus is going to do, buying into this, he would have sent the friends away, condemning them for associating with such a sick man. He would have given in to the Pharisees and backed off. He would have not healed this man because that's what everybody else was doing. Everyone else chose to ignore this paralyzed man. Everyone chose to ignore and not talk about this tough issue of why and how. What do we do? They just ignored him for their own safety and comfort. Church, everything mentionable is manageable. You can't tell me that as those four friends grabbed that guy on his cot, drug him to the ceiling and dropped him through that they didn't have a conversation first. That they were willing to acknowledge their dear friend's need for help. That he needed healing. And that they were willing to take a chance. Now don't hear me wrong. This isn't permission to give you, I'm not giving you permission to argue. To go out and start arguments and fights, nobody is. Bringing up religion and politics or anything else that's a social taboo to speak about is not giving anyone permission to say that they are right and you are wrong. Or that you are right and they are wrong. It's not that. Mentioning the unmentionable is about learning. It's about creating space for ourselves to learn and to grow. To build relationships with each other and with people who think differently than you and me person beside you, whoever. It's a chance for us to understand. So let us stop ignoring the important conversations we need to be having. Let us stop quickly changing the subject because we feel uncomfortable. Let us create space for us to understand and to hear our neighbor. Let us stop qualifying forgiveness. Let us stop qualifying the forgiveness of Christ and actually live into it. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to be a neighbor that offers forgiveness and encouragement to the person on the other side of the fence? Or are we simply going to ignore or quickly change the subject so we're not uncomfortable? Out of fear for having a real, meaning, meaningful conversation with people. The unmentionables, the things that we can't talk about or won't talk about because they make us uncomfortable go far beyond religion and politics. There's no doubt about that. We could start a list now and finish next Sunday, maybe. Let us move beyond that. Let us move beyond what makes us uncomfortable and actually be neighbors. Be people who listen to one another. Who give space to disagree and actually hear and learn something, understand our neighbor, and see how we come together rather than creating more division. May we be willing not only to lower our neighbor through the roof in their time of need, but to be lowered by our neighbor to the feet of Jesus. No matter who we voted for, no matter what direction we believe our church should go, no matter what, we have much more in common and it brings us together than what actually divides us. Christ calls us to be neighbors, to share the same deep love that God has for us with all people. And so we have to start talking to each other. Church, we have to start talking to each other Everywhere. Everywhere. Because there is far too much on the line for us to continue to run from the hard conversations. And yes, there is a time and a place to have these hard conversations. Sometimes those places are unsafe and we need to know that. Sometimes we need to make space. There is a time to have them. And there is certainly a time to be uncomfortable. May we know the difference. And church, I know this is hard. This is hard. 
But we have to believe that if everything is mentionable, that it is manageable. That if we can simply begin to have conversations that we're learning and growing and understanding, that we're offering grace and forgiveness to our neighbor, to ourselves, that we begin to find what we have in common. That we remember the person on the other side of a fence is in fact a person, not a vote or an issue or anything else. Church, let us go. Be the neighbors Christ has called us to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are listening to the Shoto, Brady, and Dunn Sermon Audio. We would love for you to join us live and in person any Sunday. You can watch the sermon video on Sunday afternoons through our Facebook page or at our website, umshoto.net. If you love what we're doing here, you can donate to our ministries at umshoto.net. Thanks for joining us wherever you are.